Stanley Janikin is, is the chief revenue officer with Cedron Technology, the, the organization behind the VAR core system, taking liquid waste and turning it into clean water, biogas, and fertilizer. Welcome to the sto- welcome to the show, Stanley. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, excited to have you on. Tell us a little about your personal life, some more about your work and why you do what you do. Yeah, absolutely. So I am an engineer for undergrad and business school for grad school. Uh, so I have a bit of the worst of both worlds. I was a computer engineer for undergrad. <laughs> so people always gave me a hard time. They're like, that's not real engineering. And then I get an MBA and people are like, that's not a real master's degree. You should get a law degree or something. So a bit of the worst of both worlds here. I uh, joined Cedron originally to do software engineering uh, and then went into business development and corporate development and fundraising roles. So really have a, a focus on leading how can we take this technology for impact? And I'm happy to walk through the technology and how I can do that. But the goal is really around, there are so many waste streams out there, things that people dispose of, people throw away, that actually have very viable nutrients or resources in them. So this concept, this paradigm of waste, and I use quotation marks in waste, how do we transform that into upcycling of those products and displace fossil fuel derived commodities. That's really something I'm very passionate about. And so my personal life, that passion really aligns well with my passion at Cedron and my job at Cedron, which is to have that impact. So they're really very much intertwined and, and focused on the same thing. I appreciate that. So when somebody asks you what you do, what do you normally say? Uh, depends on who it is. Let's, let's, uh, assume, let's j- assume we're having a beer. Unless we're having a beer, I work in the fertilizer industry. That's okay. usually what I start with. And they say, what type of fertilizer? And I'm usually like, well, climate smart fertilizers. And then they say, well, tell me a little more. And I'm like, well, we upcycle fertilizers. And they say, do you deal with poop? And I'm like, yes, we deal with various waste streams and we upcycle them into fertilizer. So it's one where people, it usually takes, I won't let people peel back the onion just a little bit. But yeah, so it's really on taking various waste streams and producing fertilizer products. Most people don't realize that nitrogen fertilizer is 3% of worldwide greenhouse gases to make. The production of ammonia fertilizer is 3% of worldwide greenhouse gas emissions. There's no reason for that. They're taking natural gas and they're, they're through the Haber-Bosch process, making nitrogen fertilizer. When there's tremendous amounts of nitrogen that exists in the environment in a form that's plant available, nitrogen comes in different forms and plants can't metabolize all the different forms. So it has to be in an ammoniacal form, which is NH3 or NH4, or a nitrate form. There's other forms as well, but they take time to break down in the soil. The air is 70% nitrogen, but it's N2. Only very specific types of plants can actually process that. So being able to capture the nitrogen that exists in nature in a form that plants can consume is a huge thing to displace that fossil fuel derived nitrogen. So that is the secret sauce. Uh, Exactly. Actually, I tell people that there's really two pieces, two groups of people in the world that we want to disintermediate. And one of them is the production of nitrogen fertilizer, 3% of worldwide greenhouse gas emissions. The other is wastewater treatment plants, which is about 3 to 6% of worldwide greenhouse gas emissions, depending upon how you measure it. And what those plants do, I'll start with the first one, takes N2 molecules, which is not a form that plants can consume, and turns them into NH3 molecules to be the Haber-Bosch process, 3% of worldwide greenhouse gas emissions. Wastewater plants take NH3 molecules and turn them into N2 molecules through nitrification, denitrification. That seems like there's a real thing you could do to close that loop. If one person's undoing the work of another, that's what we do. We step into wastewater settings we capture and concentrate those NH3 molecules and we produce a viable nitrogen fertilizer. All right. So N2 plants cannot consume N3, they can? Uh, NH3, so ammonia. N2, okay. there's various, there's certain types of plants called nitrogen fixing plants that really have nitrogen fixing uh, bacteria and such things like legumes that can process N2, uh, things like clover and alfalfa. But generally, they're not. You can't exclusively have nitrogen from those. So you actually need to add nitrogen to certain other crops like corn. So why does a wastewater plant 
turn it from three to two? Is that a, just an accident or do they do it on no, purpose? No, it's very intentional. It's a very dilute and they do it on purpose. And here's why. In a wastewater setting, the nitrogen is very dilute in these streams. And the problem is, is it's, it's dilute enough where it's really difficult to capture and concentrate. But it's concentrated enough where if they didn't get rid of it, it would create the most nasty algae blooms you can imagine on the back of the wastewater plant. So oftentimes when you see these algae blooms, it's from what's referred to as eutrophication, mm -hmm. nutrient pollution, too much nutrients and waterways create these algae blooms. So the wastewater plant destroys the nitrogen so it doesn't get into the environment in a, in a deleterious way such as that. Real secret sauce of our technology is we can capture that very dilute nitrogen and then concentrate it up into something that's saleable and even more importantly, transportable. So how hard it is how hard is it to put your technology in a wastewater plant? Uh, it's from a technical standpoint, it's pretty straightforward. Anytime you're dealing with public infrastructure, there's a political process you have to go through. It takes a lot of time from a political standpoint. From a technical standpoint, we've developed the technology. It runs. We have a system in Seattle <laughs> processing human waste every day. We have systems in the Midwest processing dairy waste. We process distillery waste streams, all very, very viable from a technical standpoint. It's purely the political process of going through the public process and procurement for wastewater plants. We're in the middle of that process in many places. And it's one where we feel as we continue to grow in that space, uh, we're going to tr truly transform the wastewater space for the better of society, right? It's less expensive than conventional technologies too. So when you're less expensive and you're solving an environmental problem, that's impactful. Because if you can make money from being an environmentalist, everyone will be an environmentalist. That is the truth. This is a this is a really, really dumb question, but what I'm going to ask anyway, or maybe it's a great question. On planet <clears throat> Earth, within just within the planet, is there new water that is being created all the time, or is it the same water that's just constantly being recycled? Uh, there are two pieces to this. There's the fresh water that rains. There's the so out of the ocean, the water will evaporate and it won't rain. You get Great Lakes rain, that kind of stuff. That's water being recycled. There are chemical processes that happen that are producing new water molecules. So for example, <clears throat> when you run a jetliner, it has hydrocarbons in it. And you've seen the, the, the tails on the, on the airplane, you'll see it in the sky, right? And it looks like a cloud behind it. What that is, is that is CO2. And if you take hydrocarbons, and you combine them with oxygen, you end up with CO2 and H2O. The emission is water. So new water is being chemically synthesized on a regular basis. Got it. And so when water is is flowing out of wastewater facilities, it's it's flowing out of out of out of farms and dairy operations and things like that. How is it? Is it being cleaned? How is 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 there a natural process for for sort of doing what the Varcore system does? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So there's the problem is the natural process is very small scale and slow. Here's the natural process: a cow goes into a field, and there's ten cows in a hundred acre field. They go to the bathroom, and the water from their urine and their their manure goes onto the field. The water goes down, Microbi microbial bacteria will consume the nutrients, put it into the plants, and it will basically be absorbed and the soil will filter and clean that, and it will go into the aquifer. The problem is, is that that's referred to as a non-point source. When you get the higher populations like we have in the U.S. and other countries, you end up with point sources. We end up with a concentrated stream at your wastewater plant, for example. The volume and scale of what's happening there, you couldn't put the waste, there, there's not enough acres to put the water on to do that. Mm -hmm. So the only way to do it is you have to treat it in some uh, enhanced treatment method. So that's why you can't do it that way, right? If you had to go back 20,000 years, there was a natural cycle, but there weren't that many people, right? We didn't have Manhattan, right? Those are the sorts of things that as you grow a society, you there's certain technologies that you need to add to because of these factors of population density and scale. 
so do you have a sense of how many wastewater facilities are operating in the United States or or in Manhattan or commonly in a a a, a urban environment? There's one on Manhattan. It's actually most people don't know this. I don't know if you've been to Manhattan. I have. Uh, but on the Upper West Side, there's this beautiful park that's like jutting out into the Hudson River. And that's this big concrete thing. And there's a beautiful park on top. That's a wastewater plant. Most people don't realize that. Uh, in the U.S., there's about 14,000 wastewater plants. I want to take a step back. People often take a dig like, oh, we shouldn't use nitrogen fertilizer because of the environmental impacts. And I agree, there are environmental impacts to it. And we are working to mitigate those so we can actually not have to synthesize nitrogen anymore. People don't realize that half of the human population on Earth is alive today because of the Haber-Bosch process and nitrogen fertilizer. Half the world population would starve to death without synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. So we need technologies to reduce the emissions and the greenhouse gas emissions of these things. But we still need nitrogen fertilizer. A world where you don't have nitrogen fertilizer means you get three and a half billion people, not seven billion people. It is, it is essential to the growing of food and everything else. But Another there's a better way. Just, there is absolutely a better way. But something that's also essential too. Uh, people don't realize that Russia produced 25% of the world's nitrogen fertilizer. And so as you add sanctions and you have belligerent states, there's real food insecurity problems that arise, especially in poorer countries. Because I don't know if you track the price of nitrogen fertilizer. I it don't. was 4x as expensive last year as it was normally. What happens is, is in countries like this, your strawberries are slightly more expensive. In developing countries, people starve. And so as you can produce technologies that can at a state level or a county level can recycle nutrients that allow you to be insulated from the prices of commodities, right? Imagine you are recycling everything. You all of a sudden now would not be exposed to the price of commodities. So being able to produce food decoupled from energy prices, decoupled from nitrogen fertilizer prices is something that allows food security in developing countries. Which is a super powerful thing, obviously. All right. So what is what is the best way to describe the impact of 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 retrofitting or putting your system the varcor system onto a wastewater plant be it in a developing country or be it in manhattan like what what kind of impact is is that yeah first off there are regulatory impacts so biosolids which is what human waste in a in a concentrated form is referred to as there's a lot of regulations around it and there's a lot of potential uh, litigious liability as you actually make these products. So we produce what's referred to as a class A EQ biosolid. And that's the highest grade of biosolid. Basically, it's a concentrated fertilizer product. That, from a regulatory standpoint, is very easy to deal with. Many wastewater treatment plants, especially large wastewater plants, currently produce a class B product, which is not a nice product. It has pathogens in it. It has odors. It is wet. It has to be applied on specially permitted fields. It has to be monitored. It's very expensive to deal with. So immediately there's a regulatory impact. And with that regulatory impact is the savings to taxpayers and, and ratepayers. So immediate from a uh, fiscal standpoint, there's a savings. From an environmental standpoint, <clears throat> we capture nutrients that the wastewater treatment plant normally has to process. So what happens is that all that, that effort to turn the NH3 molecules into N2 molecules, that is really not trivial. It's very difficult to do that with a tremendous amount of energy. We capture those NH3 molecules, allowing the wastewater treatment plant to better process the incoming stream for other things it needs to process, such as biological oxygen demand, uh, chemical oxygen demand. Those sorts of things are able to process better because we're removing the nitrogen from the system. Additionally, uh, we're much more compact than conventional processes. So most wastewater plants are on the water because that's where they have to discharge too. But when you're on the water, you generally are real estate constrained. So with a, a highly efficient real estate footprint, it allows them to install the system. But the biggest piece is really around a financial savings and the environmental savings from allowing them to have higher capture efficiencies of the nutrients and then process the rest of their water better. For example, 
in the Puget Sound region, which is where our Seattle processing facility is at, which is a somewhat impaired waterway. We're removing hundreds of thousands of pounds of nitrogen from that waterway, watershed every year. And that allows us to really have a, a meaningful impact all the while putting reduce or putting downward pressure on the cost of wastewater treatment in the region or less expensive than conventional processes. That's, 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 that's really cool. It's exciting. Also sort of hard to quantify taking a hundred thousand pounds of mass material out of, out of a water, out, out of water. It's amazing. So what does it actually look like? So there's, there's two pieces. So there's the total biosolids flow, which is 150,000 tons a year. So we're taking 150,000 tons of waste every year. We're producing about 150, 130,000 tons of clean water. That's just beautiful, crystal clear, clean water. The rest of that is the 20,000 tons. We actually separate into a concentrated nitrogen fertilizer and then a concentrated multinutrient fertilizer with nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in it. Uh, volumetrically, oh, I think I remember this number just to give you a visual. Uh, EB Mud, which is the East Bay Municipal something district in uh, San Francisco, I can't remember the exact name, uh, wastewater plant in San Francisco. If you were to take all the biosolids in one year from that wastewater plant, it'd be about 30% up uh, their baseball stadium. That's wild. I mean, imagine a baseball stadium and fill it a third the way full. Yeah. So that gives you an idea of the volumes. And that's one wastewater plant in one city. And, and San Francisco has numerous wastewater plants, right? So I use that as a nice visual to show the scale of the problems we're dealing with here are huge. The costs currently involved are huge with a deleterious environmental impact. So you, if you step in with a technology that's less expensive, and solves the environmental problems, both from a nutrient pollution standpoint and a greenhouse gas emission standpoint, and you're less expensive. That's pretty cool. Totally agree. So the opportunity is massive. The challenge is we want to keep people safe and we have existing laws and there's just, we're doing things the way that we're doing them currently. So we're just trying to get people to change how they're currently doing things. Exactly. But I think the key here is, is that lots of people in the wastewater space want to change. They want to get better because nobody does. Nobody wants to have an old wastewater plant. They want to be the best. What they need is public support. What they don't need is someone just showing up to every city council meeting protesting because it's new. And it's not even that new. We've been doing this for years, right? I was at a city council meeting in Florida. And we're presenting this thing. It's going to produce like 40 manufacturing jobs in this region, really good jobs. It's going to have a huge tax base. It's going to be less expensive for the city. And someone protested. And there was not, not a single thing that you can actually measure. And they're like, I'm against it. And so what I would ask people, if people want to make an impact here, support your local governments to do productive things. Don't just block things. Right, this idea that's not in my backyard, this nimbyism, uh, creates all sorts of problems. And for us in wastewater, if you say the words biosolids, people get freaked out. And it's just, it's just stuff. It's nothing even that important. And people really get wound up. So I'd ask if people want to make an impact, support your local governments to make change. Don't block everything. A very, very human of us. Stanley, it was really funny. <laughs> you're like, really? You're not. You're, yeah. you're 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 not for this. What? Yeah. I'm like, nope. Thanks. Thank you. No. Exactly. Oh man. Well, Stanley, thank you so much for coming on. Where where can people learn more about you and and Cedron and the Varcore system? Yeah, absolutely. I'm on LinkedIn. You're welcome to to see me there, Stanley Janicki. Uh, our website, www.cedron.com. You can read about our VARCOR system uh, and feel free to reach out. Uh, we're at various conferences in the wastewater space and the dairy space and the stillage space. And uh, hopefully we can we can connect. I like it. Well, if you enjoyed this much as I did, show Stanley your appreciation. Share it today's show with a friend who also appreciates good ideas. Go to 
Cedron.com, S-E-D-R-O-N.com, and check out everything that Stanley's been talking about today. You can find Stanley Janicki, J-A-N-I-C-K-I, on LinkedIn, and uh, I'll list all those in the notes of the show. Thanks again, Stanley. Perfect. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the opportunity. Until next time, remember, do your part by doing your best.